starting on endocrine system. Uh, this is a long, kind of involved set of notes. It's also one of my favorites. Um, it does take a while to organize the information, so um, if as you are getting started, you get a little frustrated because you're overwhelmed. Realize that it will clarify as time goes on, but it does take a minute. In addition, um, there is a decent amount, not just to understand, but also some stuff you have to memorize in this set of notes. And so I gave you, in addition to the notes, um, there is a spreadsheet right here. Um, which is, once we get into the specific endocrine organs and the specific hormones, um, you have to know the same things about each one. And instead of having to pick them all out of your notes over and over again, you may want to organize them here. For instance, this is trying to tell you that there are seven hypothalamus hormones that you're responsible for. Sometimes they have alternate names, sometimes they don't. Um, the chemical class of the hormone, which is what we're going to do today. Is it um, a lipid-soluble hormone? Is it a peptide? Is it whatever? Um, the target of the hormone, right? And um, then there are a few other columns. Um, there's some disorders or things associated with some of them, not all of them. So <clears throat> this um, table, this spreadsheet, is a place for you to organize the things in your notes. If it's not in your notes, you don't have to put it in the spreadsheet, okay? So I've limited it to the number of hormones that I discuss in your notes and the number of, um, you'll have all this information, you'll be able to pull it out of your notes. What I would do is, as I'm going through the videos or listening in class, whatever we go through that day, I'd make sure that I fill in, or in that video, make sure that I fill in um, so that you don't leave this until the end. Okay, so with that in mind, um, the only thing that we'll do in this video for this is sort of the chemical class of the hormone. I'm gonna go ahead and get that out of the way um, relatively early. Okay, so uh, Roman numeral three is basically just the functions of the endocrine system. So we did some good solid work at the beginning about understanding that homeostasis is the general goal that you are going to predict. The way to do it is negative feedback. Sometimes you're going to do it by extrinsic regulation. Um, and one of the primary ways to do extrinsic regulation is with hormones. So um, the endocrine system is one of the body's two major control systems. And when I'm talking about control, usually what you're doing is communicating in order to maintain homeostasis. Not always, but usually. Um, so the endocrine system is one of the body's two major control systems, but the other system is the nervous system, okay? And we got into the nervous system just a little bit and we'll actually do it again because we're gonna do uh, neurotransmitters, but not in this set of notes. Okay, so let's talk about endocrine organs. Um, and how this is a system, even though you probably did not cover this system in anatomy. So here's a bunch of the endocrine organs, not meant to co be comprehensive because there's so many places in the body that uh, secrete hormones. Remember that in order for something to be considered a hormone, it has to be released, then picked up by the bloodstream to travel to its target cell. That's what makes it a hormone and what kind of chemistry the hormone has can vary, but this traveling mechanism cannot vary. So if you look at the endocrine organs, how are they connected as a body system? They're really kind of functionally connected as a body system because you've got the pineal gland and like the pituitary gland and then the heart and then the testes. They're no more connected than any other organs in the body except by the bloodstream. So one of the reasons that I don't usually take the time to look at the endocrine system in anatomy is because it's not really an anatomical system. It's really a physiological system. Really the connection between, for instance, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and the testes is the hormones they release actually communicate from one place to the other to the other. So it's more of a physiological system than an anatomical system because everything is really connected by the bloodstream. It's just that the hypothalamus releases something that communicates to the pituitary gland that releases something that communicates to the testes. And then there's a feedback mechanism that we'll talk about later. So um, hormones, um, what they do is act upon what we call target cells and a target cell is really just anything with a receptor. Let me move myself over here. 
anything with a receptor for that hormone. So this is a target cell for this hormone. It may not be a target cell for other hormones because not all um, cells have the same receptors. Um, so it interacts with the target cell that has a receptor for it. Um, and then how hormones work, just the general process of how a hormone is going to work. So the general process of how any hormone is going to work is that um, a hormone is secreted, of course, and then it's picked up by the bloodstream. That makes it a hormone. And then what happens to it after that occurs? Well, the simplest fate you could imagine is that it goes straight to um, the target cell and interacts with the receptor. So it heads straight to the target cell in its current form. Um, and then if it does that, we'll come back to B, C, and D in just a second because those are the other options. If it heads straight to the target cell in its current form, what it's going to do is it's going to encounter the receptor on the target cell. It's going to bind to the receptor, and then it's going to make the target cell do something that it didn't do before. Otherwise, why bother with all of this? The something is variable because, of course, some hormones would, for instance, cause reproductive uh, maturation, like testosterone, estrogen. Some hormones actually drop your blood sugar level, like insulin. Some hormones rise your blood sugar level, like glucagon. Some hormones induce cell division, like growth hormone. So the thing that it does when it gets to the target cell is initiate some kind of process in the target cell. And um, it makes the target cell do something. We call that process in the target cell the signal transduction pathway. So if we say the hormone is the signal, then what's going to happen is something is going to happen inside the cell to cause it to respond. And that something, that pathway, is called the signal transduction pathway. We're not going to talk about the types of signal transduction pathways yet. We will talk about them um, later. Um, it's This set of notes is complicated enough. But some things that you could do um, to the target cell. You could cause the target cell to produce or secrete a new hormone. You could cause it to make a new enzyme. You could cause it to secrete something. You could cause the cell to do something or you could inhibit it from doing something, okay? But you know that the target cell is going to do something. Okay, so what are the other possibilities? If you do not go straight to the target cell in your current form, what are some other things that can happen between here and here? Well, since you go into the bloodstream, there's a lot of things that can happen on your way from point A to point B. So it could um, have to be activated on its way to the target cell. So for instance, if we said that this was a cell of a testis and this was testosterone, then what happens is testosterone actually has to be activated before it can cause a response on most of its target cells, okay? So that means that, for instance, what looked like a testosterone secretion problem may not be. It may actually be a testosterone activation problem. Okay, so um, the other thing is that since you go through the bloodstream, you can't stop the hormone from going through your liver, your kidneys, um, and when it goes through your liver or your kidneys, you can actually um, excrete some of it or inactivate some of it. So again, what looks like a hormone problem may not be a hormone problem. It may be a liver problem. The liver is over metabolizing a hormone or a kidney problem. Kidney is over excreting a hormone. Okay. Um, or um, interestingly, sometimes two hormones actually have to interact with one another in the bloodstream um, in order for one of them to be active. Um, a decent example, I won't go into it in a lot of detail, is <coughs> thyroid hormone is a metabolic hormone, supports your metabolism. Growth hormone says do protein synthesis and cell division, but there's no point in trying to do protein synthesis and cell division unless you have the thyroid hormone to support it. Okay? Okay, so these things, unless I tell you, assume that we are going to talk, don't, going to assume that the hormone goes straight to its target cell in its current form. So why the heck did I tell you these things? Well, first of all, we're going to run into a couple of examples as we go through. And second, 
this hopefully will convince you that if you have an endocrine problem, you might want to try to see an endocrinologist because this stuff is complicated. It's really complicated. Um, and the way that we're going to learn it will eventually simplify a little bit. But if you have an endocrine problem, it could be a thyroid problem, it could be a liver problem, it could be an anything problem. And you have to know that before you can treat it properly. Okay, so um, that's the general process of how hormones um, work. Now, the thing that I want to introduce you to, and we're gonna talk about in a lot of detail uh, later, is um, so what controls um, how hormones work? Um, well, ho most hormones are controlled by a negative feedback system. And what happens is what you're trying to do is to control the amount of hormones so that you don't end up with too much of any of it. So here's hormone three. Say that's the one that makes the target cell do what I want it to do. Well, too much of hormone three will be a problem and too little of hormone three will be a problem. So generally there's a negative feedback loop. We'll talk about short versus long later. But um, the typical mechanism of regulating hormone levels is that something is going to feed back to stop when you have enough of it, but what feeds back is interesting. So sometimes what feeds back is the hormone itself, like you're seeing here. Oh, I've got plenty of the hormone, the hormone feeds back, okay? Sometimes it's not the hormone. Like for instance, when you are dealing with insulin, the thing that you are actually measuring to figure out how to and when to release insulin versus not, it's not the insulin level, it's the glucose level. So that's an example of a non-hormone substance feeding back. I'll give you plenty of examples of all of these as we go through, I'm just introducing you to the concept. This example that you're seeing right here is an example of hormones controlling hormone feedback. And then there will be examples of the nervous system controlling hormone feedback. For instance, there are hormones that you release under stress, like cortisol, like epinephrine. And one of the ways that you can control those hormone secretions is by stressed out, release a lot of them, not stressed out, don't release as much of them, okay? So that's a neural control of hormone feedback. And if this confuses you, it's okay. Just introducing you to the terminology so that we can talk about it as we move through. Okay, so actually I'll stop there and then we'll do hormone structure and synthesis in the next one.